So I'm guessing you've probably heard of the Dark Side of the Rainbow, also known as the Dark Side of Oz or the Wizard of Floyd. In case you're unfamiliar, it refers to the phenomenon in which the Pink Floyd album The Dark Side of the Moon syncs up with the 1939 film The Wizard of Oz. But some people claim this isn't a coincidence. They argue that the members of Pink Floyd intentionally made the album to line up with the film and then left clues in a later album. On today's episode of Strange and Unusual Tales, we're going to dive into the history of this theory and discover if there's any truth to the dark side of the rainbow. Today's episode is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Man, eating cereal as a kid was such a blast, but as I got older, I started to realize how much sugar is in it, and I had to cut it out. But even today, I still get cravings, and that's what's so great about Magic Spoon. They basically reinvented your favorite childhood cereals with zero grams of sugar, plus each flavor provides 13 to 14 grams of protein, which is perfect for me since I'm always looking to get variety in my diet while at the same time hitting my protein goals. My favorite flavor is fruity, and it's amazing how good this tastes. You're not gonna believe it. But they also have other great flavors, including cocoa, peanut butter, frosted, and many more. So click the link below to grab a variety pack of Magic Spoon cereal and try it for yourself today. Be sure to use the promo code VinylRewind at checkout to get $5 off any order. Or go to magicspoon.com slash vinylrewind. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed by a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen and use the code VinylRewind for $5 off. Or go to magicspoon.com slash vinylrewind to save $5 today. Okay, so the theory goes, if you get a CD of The Dark Side of the Moon and a VHS or DVD copy of the 1939 version of The Wizard of Oz, but make sure it's the version with the lion in black and white, as apparently the colored version of the lion is a different version of the film and the theory doesn't work as well. Okay, so once you have the CD all queued up, wait for the third line roar, hit play after the roar, and then watch for the synchronicities. According to fans of the theory, there are about 60 places where the music lines up with the film, but some people like to take it a bit further and let the album repeat itself for a second and third time, and this brings the total up to nearly 100. Of these, the craziest ones, in my opinion, are when the lyrics Balance on the Biggest Wave coincides with Dorothy's tightrope walk. Balance on the biggest wave. The song Brain Damage matches up with the Scarecrow song If I Only Had a Brain. And when Dorothy is listening to the Tin Man's chest, the album finishes to the sound of a heartbeat. The tinsmith forgot to give me a high. But even so, there are variations on when to start the album. Some say to hit play on the first MGM Lion War, others say to do it on the second, and there are even some who say to wait for the third roar from the Cowardly Lion when he first appears. Other variations include playing other Floyd albums after Dark Side is finished, including Wish You Were Here, Animals, and even The Wall. But by far, the most popular and accepted way to experience the Dark Side of the Rainbow is one album playthrough starting on the third Lion Roar. Now, most people will say the way the album lines up with the film is pure coincidence, but believers of the theory say there are far too many synchronicities for it to just happen by chance the band had to have done it on purpose. As far as evidence, well, besides the way the music syncs up with the film, there really isn't much. The only pieces of evidence that I see getting mentioned are two images on the cover for Pulse. One is a doll wearing red shoes, similar to Dorothy's ruby slippers, and a bike that is supposed to represent the bike that the antagonist rides. And of course, there's the rainbow on the cover of Dark Side, which is seen as a reference to the film's song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Now, the origins for this theory remain a mystery. We don't know who was the first person to do this, but we do know that someone in 1994 or 95 posted about the theory on the Pink Floyd Usenet news group alt.music.pinkfloyd. From there, mainstream media caught wind of the theory in August of 1995 when the story got picked up by the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette. In the article by Charles Savage, he goes over how to replicate the phenomenon, talks about some of the more notable coincidences, and ponders if it really could be on purpose. This article, plus internet discussions, spurred fan websites to pop up devoted to the theory and other strange synchronicities. Then in April of 1997, a Boston DJ discussed the dark side of the rainbow on WZL XFM, which then led to a segment on MTV News the next month. 
In that segment, both Alan Parsons and Nick Mason denied any truth to the theory, with Nick offering, rather comically, it's absolutely nonsense. It has nothing to do with The Wizard of Oz. It was all based on The Sound of Music. By the year 2000, the theory really took off, reaching national attention in the U.S. Local news stations started covering the theory, there were special movie theater screenings, and even a reference to the theory popped up in an episode of Family Guy. Dark side of the moon totally syncs up with the Wizard of Oz. In July of 2000, the cable channel Turner Classic Movies broadcasted the film with the option to watch it synced with the album on a second audio channel. For the album's 30th anniversary in 2003, Rolling Stone magazine did a large celebration and the Wizard of Oz connection was addressed. <laughs> Over the years, those involved with the making of the album have been asked about it and all have denied any truth to the theory. And so, setting aside the complete denial from almost everyone involved in the making of the album, it is within the realm of possibility for the band to get a print of the film back in 1972 when the majority of Dark Side was recorded. And there's some credence to this since they scored one film before Dark Side and scored another while they were recording it, so they knew how to write music for film, and they were even asked by the BBC to jam out during the Apollo moon landing in 1969, but for them to make an album that's really a soundtrack to an old movie and not tell anyone, I mean, what would be the point? Uh, the album doesn't even fit the whole length of the film, and that's where, for me, the theory really falls apart. Also, take into consideration that this theory only came about when CDs and home video were ubiquitous in American homes. Trying to do this with the available music formats of 1973, vinyl, 8-tracks, or cassettes would throw the whole second half of the album out of sync. Yes, okay, I guess someone could record the album onto reel-to-reel -reel tape, but how would someone know to do that or even think of that without some direction from Pink Floyd? And that's not even considering that someone in 1973 would have to get a print of the film in order to get this to work. And even though Betamax and VHS existed at this time, both formats really weren't available to the public until 1975 and 1977. I suppose one could have done this during a TV broadcast of the film, but unless you taped it, you'd only get one chance of getting that sync right. Anyway, I think you start to see where I'm going with this. If it was intentional, it required a lot from the user with no instruction from the band. There's also the fact that Pink Floyd worked on this album while on tour. The music developed over time, and you can hear how the songs evolved by checking out the various live recordings that are available. As for the cover art, the designers were inspired by a photo of an actual prism producing a rainbow. Designer Storm Thorgerson said the cover art comes from three basic ingredients, one of which is the light show that the band put on, the themes of the lyrics, and thirdly was an answer to Rick Wright, who said that he wanted something simple and bold and dramatic. As for the imagery on the cover for Pulse, the bike could be in reference to the Pink Floyd song, Bike. As for the doll, I don't know. That one I, I can't explain. So what's really going on here? I think this is a prime example of confirmation bias, which means we generally tend to overlook the times when the music doesn't line up and just focus on the times that it does. We as humans love to see patterns and randomness, to find order and chaos, and look for meaning in unrelated events. In other words, the album really doesn't line up that much. It actually lines up less than we think, but the fact that the times that it does, it overpowers our thinking. There was a study done to understand why people believe in conspiracy theories, and the authors of that study explained it very succinctly. People often fail to appreciate how likely it is that a random process generates stimuli that appear non-random. As a consequence, people tend to underestimate the likelihood that the patterns they perceive occurred through a random process. In a similar vein, people often encounter co-occurring events in their daily life that appear non-random or purposeful, but that in fact were entirely coincidental, e.g. thinking of an old friend who then suddenly calls. I think Alan Parsons really understood what was going on when he said, if you play any record with the sound turned down on the TV, you'll find things that work. And special thanks to my Patreon member, Garrett Hicks, for recommending the site moviesyncs.com. It has a great list of 
albums and films you can try out and look for the synchronicities. Even Rolling Stone author Bill Crandall found some interesting synchronicities when he watched The Wizard of Oz with five other albums, The Chronic, Led Zeppelin IV, Nevermind, Exile on Main Street, and Thriller. And I would argue that Echoes syncs up better with the last section of 2001, A Space Odyssey. I mean, they're both about 23 minutes long. It's pretty eerie. In the end, I seriously doubt there's any truth to this theory, but that doesn't take away from the fun of it. I encourage you to try it out for yourself if you haven't already. And if you have, be sure to let me know your preferred lion roar starting point, And if you know of any other good synchronicity pairings. Until then, I want to thank you all so much for watching. But I especially want to thank my members over on Patreon. I am your Vinyl Geek, and I'll catch you on the flip side.